and I will do all of these things. Welcome and thank you all for coming. This is a very exciting event and a wonderful turnout. So I am Margo Horn and I am a member of the Los Altos Affordable Housing Steering Committee. So now um, I want to introduce our panelists in, in a little bit more detail, but I, I, um, I'm going to start with um, Natali, and I want to say that Natali came, drove here. This is why we were very grateful for her being here, and it's very relevant um, in terms of the documentary. Her drive was two hours, is that correct? Yeah. So that's the kind of traffic um, that, that we know exists during the peak hours of, of travel. So we thank you in particular for that. It's good to be uh, here. For coming. Um, Natali is an architect and urban designer, and she is part of Octicos, which is a design firm devoted to housing for the missing middle. And there she manages projects that have ranged from neighborhood infill studies to downtown specific plans, something that's important to us. So welcome. Good to know. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. I think it's Randy who goes oh, first, I think. Yeah. We, we can reverse it. Um, okay, Randy. <laughs> now, when I can introduce both speakers, and... Okay. I'm a Randy uh, Suda is currently the president and CEO of Palo Alto Affordable Housing, uh, which is a nonprofit focused on affordable housing for Silicon Valley. <clears throat> and before that, he was director of community development for the city of Mountain View. And um, obviously, clearly, both Natali and Randy bring a wealth of experience and expertise that are um, important for our community in terms of figuring out how to build more affordable housing for Los Altos. Good evening. Um, thank you for asking me to be here. My name is Randy Suda. And as you just heard, I am the president and CEO of Palo Alto Housing. Um, what I've been asked to talk about today is to present kind of a palette of different affordable housing projects, uh, projects of different looks and feels, projects that, ca that address housing for different types of populations. Bef before I get into that, I just wanted to tell you a little bit about uh, Palo Alto Housing. We are an independent nonprofit agency. We were formed roughly 50 years ago. And we provide affordable housing in South San Mateo County and Northern Santa Clara County. So we do four basic things. We develop affordable housing projects. We manage, uh, we manage those projects on behalf of our own portfolio. And also we do some project uh, property management for other property owners also. We provide resident services for our, for our tenants. Uh, and that ranges and varies according to the type of uh, tenants that we have. We run after school programs, study halls, we uh, sponsor programs in financial literacy, we help our tenants uh, complete their taxes. And uh, the fourth aspect that we do is we provide affordable housing services to outside city, outside agencies. So we have a, we've just entered a contract with the city of Los Altos, for example, and we've had agreements with cities of Palo Alto and Mountain View for many years. We have uh, 24 properties. We provide housing for uh, almost 2,500 residents currently. And on top of that, we have six projects currently in the pipeline, um, ranging from un the unincorporated area of uh, just outside Redwood City in the North Fair Oaks neighborhood, if you're familiar with that. We got approval uh, two weeks ago for a project in Palo Alto, and we have four projects in the pipeline in, in Mountain View, including a project uh, for which we hope to get approval from the Mountain View City Council at the end of February. So that's a little bit about, um, about Palo Alto housing. I'm going to show you a range of projects, some of which are our projects, some of which are uh, projects from other nonprofit entities. And the, as you'll see, these are projects of different scales, different looks and feels, some of which will be more relevant to Los Altos. Some of, some of these I'm going to present to you just as food for thought in case a larger opportunity were to arise someday. 
So this is our treehouse project. This is the a project that was completed roughly seven years ago um, in Palo Alto. It's the, in South Palo Alto. Uh, it is a it's a project that provides provides a housing for a range of incomes, generally from 30 to 60 percent of the area median income. And you will f hear that's a fairly common income spectrum if you're doing a, a project funded by tax credits, which I'll touch upon in a few minutes. Uh, it's, a, it's a project that um, provides, as you can see, a lot of outdoor space towards the rear of the project. And that was uh, one of the things we did to integrate the back of the project into a, an existing residential neighborhood. This is our Oak Court project. It's in downtown Palo Alto. Uh, it's on land that was previously controlled by um, uh, the Palo Alto Medical Foundation. And it was, if you may remember about, it's going about 15 to 17 years ago, Palo Alto Medical Foundation consolidated their, consolidated their facilities on El Camino, freed up quite a bit of land outside the, right near the downtown. Part of the city's requirements was to provide a site for affordable housing, which became Oak Court. And in this case, there was a historic uh, house that existed on the property, which was renovated and preserved and is now serves as the community room, both for our residents and uh, access is provided to uh, groups outside of Palo Alto housing. In fact, that's where we have our board meetings. So we, we get ample use of that. Uh, of that facility, and we know it well. And I think it, one of the things to take note of is that you know this has a, a character. The city and the community really asked to have the architecture blend in with the historic uh, character of Professorville. Uh, and you'll see the horizontal wood siding, the pitched roofs, other features that really pick up on a more historic uh, character. And I think the project really fits in nicely into the downtown. This is the project to Wilton Court that was approved by the Palo Alto City Council two weeks ago. It is on El Camino um, at Wilton Ave Avenue. Uh, I, th I think a very different character. It's a much more urban form and something that now complies with uh, Palo Alto's design guidelines and zoning code of pulling the buildings up, up to the street. Um, in this case, we similarly step the rear of the building back. It's four stories in the front, three stories in the back, and we pulled the rear of the building away from the residential neighborhood and created a courtyard and, and patio area at the back to provide uh, both open space and amenities for our residents, but also provide that uh, enhanced buffer between us and, and our residents. We are quite proud um, and thankful that at the end of the day, the leaders of the Ventura neighborhood actually came to the Palo Alto City Council in support of our project. Um, we were thrilled to have that happen. We had a whole series of really um, productive, dis ongoing discussions with, uh, with the community, which resulted in a project that we're proud of, a project that clearly had the support of that neighborhood. So, um, we're thrilled with the outcome of this, this one. This is a project we're going to be breaking ground on. And this is the project I referenced in the North Fair Oaks neighborhood, again on El Camino Real. Um, another four-story project, a similar design concept where we carved the rear portion of the building away and, uh, and created another courtyard or a patio area. And the bottom corner, it gives, that's the site plan, gives you a sense of how we tried to reduce the bulk of the rear portion of, the, of that project. But it, you know, the character of this project and the design, we use different architects, different materials. We followed the lead of staff, and in this case, the County of San, uh, County of San Mateo, to create a structure that they were comfortable with. Now, this is a project, it's an existing project in downtown Mountain View by uh, Rome Development. It's been there, I'd say, for about seven years or so now. It's a project specifically for families. Uh, it's, it, um, you may have, if you visit downtown Mountain View, you may have walked by or seen this project a number of times and probably had no way of knowing that it was an affordable housing project. Um, 
it's a project that is, as I said, specifically designed and targeted for um, lower income families with children. So there's a steady room, there is a computer lab in there uh, where the equipment and the computers were purchased in partnership with Google. There's um, a large, in this case, a very, very large community gathering area that's right off si uh, right um, outside of the, uh, the open space area that has this indoor-outdoor feel where parents can actually be inside in the lounge area and still be monitoring their children that are, that are playing outside. This is another project that you may have driven by a number of times. It's called 1585 Studios by First Communities Housing. Um, it, is, um, it is between Castro and El Monte on the on the Los Altos side of El Camino. It is a project that is specifically uh, designed for adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, these are folks that are members of our community, the Palo Alto community. These are uh, adults with developmental disabilities that have the capabil capability of living independently. They do not have caregivers on site. They do not live with their parents. This gives them the opportunity to have jobs, to live independently, learn, uh, learn life skills in an environment where they're supported and, and counseled and able to, able to provide a meaningful role in, in all of our communities. It's a similar, um, our Wilton Court project that in Palo Alto also will have roughly 35% of the units targeted for adults with developmental disabilities in that project also. Now, to, leaping to a different scale, um, again, these are food for thought. Um, as you never know when an opportunity may arise uh, or a partnership opportunity may come to the fore. Uh, this is a project that's still going through the review process in Mountain View. It is a partnership between Fort Bay Development and the Mountain View Wisman School District. In this case, originally the developer uh, let me back up. I think one of the critical takeaways here is Mountain View has uh, clear affordable housing requirements and they have clear expectations around community benefits. The, that is the obligation of a developer to go above and beyond the minimum requirements of the zoning code and city policies to provide something else in a tangible way back to the community. This developer originally proposed uh, a roughly 120 to 140 unit affordable housing project, and that's the project identified with the arrow, that is along Shoreline Boulevard. We approached the Mount View, you, you may recall the Cooper Park signs that you've seen throughout the Mount View community, save Cooper Park. In response to that, we approached Fort Bay um, and asked them about potentially pursuing a partnership with the Mount View Wisman School District. What the city gets out of this deal is an agreement to preserve the open space on the Cooper School. Um, Mount View Wisman gets the potential to build 140 units of, of housing for staff and for teachers. And by discounting the, the ground, providing a discounted ground lease, discounted land value, the developer is then providing that community benefit that, all, that makes this all happen. It gets complicated as the developer, Fort Bay, walked away from a low-income project. They were also walking away from tax credit <coughs> funding. So fortunately, Mount View Wisman was able to come, come to the table with Certificate of Participation Financing. So they're essentially self-financing a lot of this project, <coughs> leveraging off the discounted land that the, the developer is providing as a community benefit. <coughs> so certificates of participation are essentially funded by the expected revenue stream from the rents that will be paid by their teachers and employees. And they're able to provide a mixture of rents and mixture of units, some low income for janitors, teacher, teacher aides, and other staff like that, others for moderate income teachers. So they get to target that, that income mix and the unit mix to their, to their employees. It's a second, uh, 
example of a project still going through the process in Redwood City. This is a partnership between Sobrato Development and Mid Penn Housing, another affordable housing developer. Um, similar basic concept. In this case, Sobrato is, is providing land and, and providing a site on which Mid Penn Housing will, will build a, roughly 120 units of affordable housing. Uh, clearly, this is a much bigger project than you would, are likely to ever see in Los Altos. But I think you take the, the, the idea of looking for opportunities when they present themselves to look, look for partnerships in ways that you can generate housing or other types of community benefits that can benefit whether they're school districts, public employees, and other critical members of the Los Altos community. So, I'm just going to touch very, very briefly around um, the cost of affordable housing and how, and big picture, they're funded. This is a, this spreadsheet, I've blanked the names to protect the innocent, but <laughs> these are the last six affordable housing projects that have been approved and funded by, uh, in the city of Mountain View. Um, you can see the range of project costs. They vary widely according to the size of the project. Some are as small as 26 units, some are as large as uh, roughly 120 units. But we've also broken the costs. What's probably more meaningful is the, we've broken the costs down by a couple key metrics. One is cost per unit, and then the other is uh, um, then the local subsidy per unit. So you get a sense of how much money um, Mountain View in particular is, is putting into the, some of these deals. We're in a very, for affordable housing developers, um, well, you, I'm sure city council members have heard market rate developers complain about the cost of construction and the cost of land, the shortage of labor, on and on and on and on. For affordable housing developers, that is all true. Right. For many instances, we are buying land on the open market in a private land transaction. We're hiring contractors that often do both affordable housing and market rate housing. We're all impacted by the same uh, dramatic year-over-year -year rise in construction costs. We're, all, we're both affected by tariffs, and we're both affected by a shortage of construction labor throughout the Bay Area. So these numbers... Um, <coughs> Uh, these numbers, if you were to do a project, some of our more recent projects, some of the more recent projects our fellow affordable housing developers are proposing, those, these numbers are going up significantly. But this is just to give you a sense of the last six that, uh, for which I had data from Mountain View. So sources of funding, um, in many cases, uh, these projects rely on a significant share of uh, local contribution or local funding. Here are some ways that communities have generated funds and revenues to support affordable housing. They range from fees on you know, non-residential development, fees levied on other market rate, uh, market rate residential projects, community benefits that I've referenced before. Um, on the county has passed Measure A f to support and help uh, sponsor housing for, uh, that is permanently supportive housing for those transitioning at, or at risk of homelessness. Um, some communities, some larger cities have passed uh, bonds that specifically go to fund affordable housing. I know the city of San Jose had one on the ballot in November, and it, it did fail. Hopefully, we'll get some state legislation to drop the required percentage to pass a bond from two-thirds down to 55%. At the 55% threshold, San Jose's bond measure would have passed. So I think that's a key part of opening up more opportunities for local housing funds. City doesn't have funds. Um, other opportunities are city-owned land. Look at the land that, that a community has and providing that free or at a heavily discounted rate uh, certainly helps and is a form of contribution. And then lastly, the willingness to waive fees can help reduce the costs. Um, just as an order of magnitude today, I signed checks for over a million dollars in 
in city fees for another project. So these, this is real money. Uh, so that you, your willingness to invest in the project, even if you don't necessarily have the funds, you do have the ability to control the fees and waive fees. Uh, most projects these days leverage uh, a variety of state and federal uh, funding sources. I'm not going to go into all these. These are just some of the funding sources that affordable housing uh, developers will will um, utilize. Almost all of us use the LIHTC Low Income Housing Tax Credit in which the private marketplace corporations will provide equity into for uh, affordable housing in exchange for a tax credit. And that's a very, very popular program, heavily used for uh, most affordable housing projects in California. I uh, just also want to make mention of uh, MHP, Multifamily Housing uh, Program. That will get uh, an infusion of money from the state's passage uh, of Proposition 1. Hopefully you all voted for that. Um, Six billion dollars of increased funding for a broad range of affordable housing program, programs. Over a billion, roughly a billion and a half dollars will flow into Prop 1, into this <coughs> MHP program. And I'm sure you've heard l recently about the governor's budget message, which has an uh, even greater commitment to provide affordable housing in various forms, both for uh, to, spot, uh, in, to increase the availability of state housing tax credits, and also, I think importantly, opening up funds for local governments to local governments that um, are meeting their housing obligations and local governments that wish to up do some updated planning in anticipation of housing. And I think, as I, as I mentioned uh, last week at the leadership group, I think that's critical between the governor's proposal and the uh, Chan Zuckerberg initiative that funds be set aside specifically for local government. That gives agencies, the community, residents, the ability to craft plans to identify the likely and desirable locations for housing create that vision and craft plans that really can help mold a project, affordable housing project, into something that will work for your community, that is tailored for your community. So I leave you with that. It was a lot, a lot of examples, a panoply of way these, ways these projects are funded. Um, happy to answer questions afterwards. And at this point, I think I will yield the floor. How happy I am to be here, and especially after the two hour long commute, I was very happy to find you each here. So, okay, so I'm here to talk about something that I feel very passionate about, and this is missing middle housing. And it's quite a mouthful, but we'll, and we'll be using it a lot, and we'll get into more of it. But essentially, it's a, it's a concept of introducing more housing, and uh, this is an effective way of addressing a bunch of housing related issues that we're facing in our cities and communities. So uh, we'll be doing a deeper dive into that. But first of all, let's look at what's happening in the country, and let's try and understand the context. And um, across the country, not just in some areas, but um, almost as a universal trend, we're finding that people are opting to live in areas which are more walkable. And by this, I don't necessarily mean downtown living. You know, that's for some people, not for everyone. But increasingly, people are realizing that there are many benefits to being uh, in a place where they can drive if they want to, but they don't need to. You know, there are other options such as walking and biking, and it's not just possible to do it, it's actually enjoyable to do it. So that's where we're seeing a paradigm shift happening across the country in many different locations. And cities are also trying to prioritize <coughs> mobility, and that's for many reasons. And this is because there are proven benefits to the health of a community. You know, you have a more active and a more vibrant community. It's safer because people start recognizing each other and you know, they, they just find better ways of communicating with each other. And also it's, uh, we're in California, so it's also inherently uh, more environmentally responsible, you know, just to be investing more in the land that we already have instead of spreading out uh, as sprawl. But often we find that there's a major disconnect. And by that I mean that the housing industry is typically providing 
um, what I can categorize as city living or downtown living. And there is a place for it, but it's not the only solution for providing a walkable environment in different environments. What I'd like to talk about more is neighborhood living. And by this, I mean, I'm sorry, it's a little bit of it is getting cut off, but um, I'm speaking out the titles, so I hope you won't miss anything. By neighborhood living, we mean what I think is a large demographic in the country who want to have their home, whether it's a single family home or a different type of home, with their little backyard and good schools, but also being able to walk to a corner grocery store or meet a friend for you know, coffee at another small place nearby, and all of this without having to drive. So can we provide a walkable environment in these types of places, like at the neighborhood level? And that's what I want to try and discuss today with you. Also, we should try and understand what's happening in terms of demographics. And uh, this is quite a sobering fact, which is that uh, within uh, 2025, which is approximately 10 years or less from now, as many as 85% of households in the United States would not be households with children. And we're talking about millennials, we're talking about singles, we're talking about retirees and boomers, we're talking about single parents, and it's a very large group, and they have very diverse needs. And that need may not necessarily fit into only the predominant type that's been provided you know, by the housing market right now, which is either the single family home or you know, like a large mixed use or large residential, more urban scale kind of project. And also, you know, when we're talking about choices, there are very limited choices. And the reasons for this are many. You know, you either can live in, a, in an entire block filled with townhomes, or you can get a detached single family home, or you can live, again, in a more urban scale apartment or a condominium block. And also, uh, tagging onto this is, you know, the affordability gap in housing. And I don't think it's too much of a stretch to call it a housing crisis. And it's not just in the Bay Area. It's becoming a nationwide phenomenon. And I find this particularly scary that, uh, again, within less than 10 years, we have as much as 15 million US households spending more than 50% of their income on rent or on you know, paying down their mortgage. And uh, statistics show that the sustainable figure for this is not more than 30% of a family's income. So how do we deal with this? And also, let's not forget uh, something which is actually great, that we have an aging population. People are living longer, healthier, happier lives. But this group is increasingly more and more vulnerable to this problem of housing affordability. And uh, again, these figures are from a website um, which is called Home.One, that as many as 10,000 baby boomers are retiring every day for the next 15 years. So where will these people go? And if you can just see, I think it's almost laughable uh, that if you just have $1,300 coming in the form of Social Security um, dividends to you at the, after retirement, there's almost nothing that you can afford uh, to do with that. So, so the crisis is real, and um, what can be a solution? So there is obviously no one magic bullet which can you know, solve all these different but related um, housing issues, but we feel something worth exploring is the concept of missing middle housing. So what exactly is it? And um, first of all, if you look at the diagram, the buildings on the edges that you see, you know, those uh, more grayish, purplish kind of buildings, that is what is being readily provided by the housing market right now. We have a wide variety of single family homes, and we have, again, the urban mixed use or urban residential buildings that are being provided. But this wide variety of possible housing types in the middle is something that is just not being produced anymore. <coughs> And the reason for this is interesting because we used to have this. This is not a new concept. And if we look at any city which was built prior to the 1940s, we find them. And uh, you know, it's, it, it could be a duplex, it could be a multiplex, it could be a live-work unit or a cottage court. The names are different, but we see them in small communities. And we see them in larger cities. These are examples from Dallas, Texas, from Minneapolis in Minnesota. This is Denver, Colorado. This is New Orleans. So by showing you these images, what I'm trying to say is that it's not an East Coast phenomenon or a West Coast phenomenon or a small city or a big city phenomenon. These housing types existed. And they are housing types that developed in an organic and in a natural manner over the course of cities growing and developing. But when 
around the 1940s when people chose to move to the suburbs and um, you know the city centers lost all the interest and investment from our policy makers these were the types that uh, performed best in the urban core or in the city core or in the centers of all our communities and once now that the trend has reversed and people don't want to live in the suburbs and many people are moving back into downtowns and into the centers of our communities, we've lost that knowledge because for the last 50 years we've not been building this. So this is actually what we try and call it, uh, call missing middle housing. It's house scale buildings. It's multiple units in a building, so it's multi-family housing, but it looks like a house and it feels like a house and it fits in very well within established residential neighborhoods. If you were to walk past some of these houses, you may not even notice that it can house as many as four units because it just looks like a house and it feels appropriate in that, in that context. So what are some, I'm gonna just break down some of the characteristics of what we call missing middle housing. And first of all, walkable context. You know, I just started by saying how walkability is an important aspect you know, of our cities and it, there is a clear trend preferring that. But missing middle performs best when you have a walkable context. Because the entire premise is that people are choosing to live in these kind of homes and they're giving up the amenity of having a large home or a large space and they're trading it for the amenity of being in a place where they can walk and access amenities in an easy manner. So walkable context is key. And by walking, of course, I'm not talking about recreation or like walking for exercise, I'm talking about what could be called destinational walking, that you're walking to carry out your daily chores, you're walking to meet a friend, you're dropping off your dry cleaning or taking your child to piano lessons, but you have a choice of being able to do that by simply walking and not just having to drive. So as people make a conscious choice to live in such environments, we find that you know a walkable context is important just to support this kind of housing. And it's a mutually reinforcing relationship because you know all these things that we like of having a, a corner grocery store or having a small drug store where you can just you know go and pick up something that you forgot, like you know you did your groceries but you forgot the milk and you don't want to drive all the way back to Safeway or Whole Foods, but there is a corner store where you can just go and pick up something. Similarly, a small cafe or a small restaurant, but these kind of amenities are not possible unless we have a certain minimum threshold of households. And in terms of density, even though we don't like to use that word a lot, it's almost like a density of 15 to 16 dwelling units an acre. And you just can't achieve that and still maintain the look and feel of a neighborhood if you don't use building types such as missing middle. And uh, another important characteristic is uh, that they are small footprint buildings. They're not big imposing structures. And by small, I don't mean tiny homes small. You know, there's a place for that, but this is not it. But we're talking about buildings such as this, and this is a duplex, and it's just two homes, and again, you could walk by without realizing that there are two homes. They're two smaller homes, and it's not tiny. You know, we're talking about anything from a minimum of 750 square feet for a unit to roughly around 1,000, 1,100 square feet a unit. So it's small by suburban standards, but it's not tiny. You know, it's entirely livable. And so you have duplexes, for instance. This is one of my favorites, it's a bungalow court. So you have smaller homes around a shared common open space, and we're seeing a lot of examples such as this, not just in older cities, but even in some other places, um, like I've, I've seen a bunch of these in Berkeley. And they're not new, you know, they've been around since the 60s and 70s, because people found a loophole around existing zoning laws, and they chose to live this way. Similarly, a fourplex, and I think I showed this image earlier, it's like a bigger house for sure, but it's still not like having a massive apartment building right adjacent to a single family home. Similarly, a live work unit, you know, and this is an example that was built by Opticals, and um, it's an example from Buena Vista in Colorado, in which the ground floor is a separate unit, which could be used for either a commercial use or some kind of a live work space, or it can even be rented out as a separate unit, like an income property of sorts, or an in-law unit for an extended family or any number of reasons. And the unit above is another residential building in itself. And pretty much at the upper end of the missing middle scale is um, this example of courtyard apartments. So yes, this is bigger than some of the other examples that we saw, but even then, I wouldn't say it would feel completely out of place in a traditional single family residential neighborhood. So by showing you these, what I'm trying to again point out is that many of these actually have far higher densities 
than what we typically think of when we look at apartments. This is actually 50 dwelling units per acre, but it doesn't look that way and it doesn't feel that way. So often it's a mistake, you know, which is commonly made and repeated even by, you know, uh, professionals in the field that, you know, we start the conversation with density. But density is just a number. You know, what we feel uh, is more important and more relevant for people is to think about the form and the character of what we're talking about. And then we, density becomes an output. It doesn't become the starting point of the conversation. And yes, um, the most uh, pertinent part about this is, again, lower perceived density. And why is this important? Uh, simply because of what we just discussed, that people often get scared of density. And for good reason, because often, for some people, you know, this feels too much. And, you know, there's a place for this kind of housing, and there's nothing inherently wrong about this. But this is more appropriate for certain locations within our cities and communities. This is more about what I would call urban scale or downtown scale, um, you know, density. But at a neighborhood scale, density often looks like this, you know, which in my opinion is even worse. You know, you have a bunch of buildings, <laughs> and we have this, this, this slab structure with like, I don't know, eight, ten units, and it's not even facing the street. You know, you see the side of the building with no openings, you know, no entrances, and often a staircase, you know. So is this how, this is the way we've seen density getting introduced into our neighborhoods, and it's not surprising why people react to it. But if, if you design it well, then density can also look like this. You know, each of these types has a density higher than the preceding slide that you saw, but it's much more appropriate, you know, for certain residential contexts. And well-designed units, and why is this important? Because we're choosing to have smaller units. So if a smaller unit has to sell at different price points for different user groups, then it needs to be designed well. And I think even Randy would agree that, you know, the true challenge of architecture is designing a really well-designed smaller unit because you can do a lot more if you've got more space. But by a smaller unit, it, we don't necessarily mean that it is low income. It can be, you know, it's not just for the lower end of the housing market. You can have a well-designed unit and outfit it with you know, higher quality finishes and higher high-end appliances. And you can, in fact, we have some developers uh, that have tried this to have the same unit plan, but outfit it with these different finishes and appliances at completely different price points, but within the same building. So that could be a very interesting way of trying to get you know, diversity of income groups to actually live in really close proximity. I don't know how well that will work out, but you know, it's possible, is what I'm saying. And uh, I think this is a favorite topic for almost everyone in the South Bay Park. Yeah. <laughs> and people often get scared, you know, and this is related to density that, oh, you know, we're going to add 100 more people in my neighborhood. Where are they going to park? You know, and if we think about many of our single family neighborhoods, there are zoning, um, lo there are zoning rules in place and minimum parking requirements. And often it's something like two or two and a half spaces per unit. And so people automatically think that, you know, where will these 300 new cars go? But the reality is that these are, these are attracting a certain kind of population. You know, people who are moving to these homes because they don't want to have two cars. And that's why the walkable context is important because the two of them reinforce each other. So our opinion, I mean, as professionals, is that you have limited land if you want to just reinvest in your cities. So we can choose either to house people or house cars, or maybe you know invest in parks more. But you know it's it's just that often research shows that the burden on the city in terms of additional parking is nowhere near what people fear it might be when missing middle is introduced into a neighborhood. And also inherently because they're smaller units and they take less land and they're typically not more than three or four floors in height, they're simple construction. And by that, I mean it's also cheaper to build. So tying this in with the issue of affordable housing, you know, right now, the most commonly seen options are that you either get a subsidy for building affordable housing, or you build enough market rate housing so that the prices come down and, you know, people, the housing prices become slightly more affordable. But what I'd like to suggest is that missing middle can potentially fill this gap in between. Because it's cheaper to build, the land costs are lower, these are smaller units, and it's also a way of not having a big project happen all at once in a neighborhood, but it can be local and it can be incremental, so it doesn't cause a lot of disturbance for existing neighbors. 
You know, it's not that you suddenly have an entire block within your city getting rebuilt for years with construction noise. It's similar to just having your neighbor add a story to their house. And that is, you know, one, one uh, reason why Missing Middle is often easier to sell to a community who's not in favor of increasing too much housing in their neighborhoods. And this is an example that I'd like to discuss. This was a project done by Opticals. Uh, this is called the Muse Housing Project, and it's in Daybreak, Utah. So uh, it, the interesting story was that we were approached by a developer because uh, they did their market analysis, and they found that they could not uh, you know, get anything built and sold for any kind of profit below the $200,000 threshold. And they saw a lot of buyer interest, especially from single professional women, but there was just nothing that they could build for anything lower than that price point of a townhouse. So this was a modified townhome, which is, again, an innovative kind of missing middle, um, uh, missing middle housing, which came in at a price point of 199000 This became one of the top selling types of housing within that development. And it was a win-win for both people because buyers could finally get something and get uh, you know like a, a piece of land that they call their own in a safe and welcoming environment, but at the same time this also got the second highest sales price per square foot for the developer. And circling back to the issue of community, so when you have missing middle housing, you know it's automatically leading to a certain kind of a community. You have a diversity of income groups, people with diverse backgrounds. You have different ages. So having this kind of a community is automatically supported by a concept such as missing middle housing. And it also lends itself to shared housing and co-housing. And these are uh, things which are not a wholesale trend yet, but we are seeing examples coming up in different parts of the country. For example, the image on the right is from a development uh, in Washington. And this is again a missing middle type in which you have smaller units which just have a kitchenette but there's a shared open space, a shared community space, and a shared kitchen. And it got sold out within six months of it being on the market. And this is not low income. This is often boomers and retirees, some single professionals, who want that sense of safety and community, and who don't want a cheap unit, you know, but they also don't want a large unit. They want something that they can maintain, and they still get all the benefits that they're looking for. And in particular, I also want to talk about the issue of our elders. You know, we've been recently doing a lot of work with the AARP, and as we have an aging population, it's almost sad that there aren't that many housing options that are available, you know, to our parents and our grandparents. You know, you try and live in a single family home till you really can't, and you know, your keys need to be taken away in some cases, and then you end up in a, you know, senior living facility. And uh, we feel that there are many benefits, and there's enough research to support this, that there are many benefits to aging in place. And this is becoming a concept that is being really promoted by the AARP. And there are mental health benefits for the people involved. And it's just, a, it's just a nicer way to be, that someone who's lived in a neighborhood for 30, 40 years shouldn't feel that they have to move out just because they cannot maintain or they don't want to maintain their large single family home anymore with a big backyard. You know, so there should be options that they can move to maybe a smaller unit, but within the same neighborhood. So they retain that sense of community, you know, especially at an age where you don't have the time and patience to make a whole bunch of new friends. So that's why I think missing many is. <laughs> so it's not just, you know, the typical groups that we think about that, you know, affordable, like this is affordability by design, right? That's what missing middle is all about. It's not just the typical groups that we think about, that workforce housing, our teachers and our first responders. It's also this demographic. And this is a huge demographic, and it's just going to grow over the next 10 or 20 years. So what do we do? You know, and do we consider them as a key group to cater to? This is a small sketch plan which shows how if you have smaller units, and uh, these are all individual missing middle unit types, within the same lot, this is about, say, 50 feet by 100 feet, you can have actually three units. But it, from the front, when you're passing by in the street, it will still look like a single family home. And this multi-generational housing is a concept that I think is something that we should all explore in the coming decades. That you know you can have a, a separate unit which is outlined in blue, which could be for maybe not just your aging parent, but it could be for your adult kid, 
you know, who's finished discovering himself or herself, and you know, until they find a job, they're going to move back in. <laughs> or you could have a small unit above the garage, which you can give out to you know, someone who really needs that kind of home. So yeah, again, more ways in which missing middle housing can fulfill a lot of our needs. So I'll just uh, speed up now because I've gotten the hint. <laughs> so this would be very quick. And again, the color coding is the same. The yellowish buildings are missing middle types. And these are just simple illustrations to show how we can insert these into different situations within our typical neighborhood blocks. So this is if you have infill parcels, if you have vacant parcels. And you can just kind of have this blended density of different kinds of housing types. But when you walk around, it'll just look and feel the same. But this is how you can literally double the density of a block without it becoming an eyesore. It could form the end grain you know, of a single family block where you have a slightly busier street and single family homes don't sell very well. This is a great place to locate missing middle. And similarly, if you have a main street condition or a larger mixed use or residential block, then again, right behind those uh, kinds of parcels, single family doesn't do very well. So that's another opportunity for trying to get in missing middle housing. And this is a topic which is another half an hour in itself, so we won't discuss it right now. But there are challenges, you know, and in many places it just starts with zoning, and that's completely on us planners, you know, what we've done for the last 50 years, and we need to change this. Is that, uh, you know, it's illegal to build uh, missing middle in many neighborhoods because it's considered multifamily, and the zoning is only for single family homes. So, you know, zoning reform is something that we really need to consider so that we don't end up with just this. You know, because this is what has created this fear of multifamily and density, because this is when there's an opportunity to build, this is what gets built. So instead, you know, we, we feel that these are another, another potential, you know, source of inspiration for all of us to try and fit into our housing, um, you know, portfolio, so to speak. And coupled with zoning reform, this can lead to a situation where, you know, we end up with uh, you know, partnerships with developers in which we see successful cases and entire neighborhoods of missing middle housing being built. These are again two recent projects that Opticos has worked on. On the left are the Muse housing um, types that I discussed from Daybreak in Utah. And on the right is an uh, entire community of missing middle types which is being uh, built right now in Prairie Queen in Nebraska. So yeah, and I'll end on that and uh, thank you for your time. So that was fantastic. Thank you both. The title, as you might remember, of this uh, evening's event is uh, Ideas, Affordable Housing, Ideas for Los Altos. And I think we've gotten a lot of fantastic ideas. And now um, is the time for your questions. And I'm going to actually ask Randy, I'm going to take the moderator's uh, privilege, and ask Randy um, if you would please tell us, tell the group about the example uh, from Jackson Hole that you mentioned um, as something that's very uh, outside of the box and creative, if you will. And then we'll... So this is a, a, something we talked about over dinner not too long ago. Is, um, not necessarily specifically about affordable housing, but the, the discussion was really about how do we leverage a, a leverage public land and a public project to serve multiple objectives, to realize multiple objectives. Uh, in the case of Jackson Hole, if you've ever been there, it, for the most part, it's a pretty small scale, uh, very, very quaint, lovely downtown. Uh, they, because of the popularity, they have built a public parking garage in downtown. But one of the great things they did, and I, it, it, I fell in love with the idea, is that at one end of that garage, they created a, a vertical farm. They created a, I believe it was a three-story parking garage. They created a three-story vertical farm in partnership with a nonprofit. This nonprofit provides employment to adults with developmental disabilities. They provide the job training so that they can live independently, learn job skills, uh, make a living. They, then the nonprofit then has agreements with local restaurants and local hotels to buy the vegetables that they grow in this vertical farm. 
So it, you know, and the community got the necessary parking, but was able, able to leverage that land in a way that not only are you providing park, parking, but you're providing opportunities for uh, less fortunate members of the community and you're creating that cycle by the product, creating products that vendors and restaurants and other establishments in Jackson are, are purchasing. So, um, you know, vertical farming is one thing, but I, I think the takeaway is that uh, if you're looking, is to look for opportunities to leverage uh, public projects, public private partnerships, love, leverage park, uh, public land to serve multiple community objectives. Whether it's a vertical farm, whether it's community space, whether it's art space, there are a myriad of things that in, in our daily lives and in our community we always say, wouldn't it be great if there was X, right? And you know, this is just something I'll seed you, I'll seed you with the concept of thing, how can we use a precious resource to accomplish multiple Thank you. All right, so it's time for your questions, please. Well, <coughs> yes. So no, this is uh, something else, but um, our speaker brought up uh, shared housing, and um, there is a shared housing program in Santa Clara with the county and Catholic charities who um, is doing the vetting. And I was hoping that we would have someone here from Cap. Oh, we do! <laughs> <laughs> would you like to tell us a little bit more about the program? Um, sure, if that's what we would like. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, I'll try to speak loudly. So the county of Santa Clara has um, a shared housing program. We've been uh, live since, or we've been operational since late August, early September. And it's basically just, we just serve as a matching service. And um, it's just basically for anyone in the county that wants to open up their home. And uh, like some of the examples that the speakers uh, mentioned, uh, what did you call it, the, a boom mate? <laughs> I've never heard that before, that was nice. Um, just matching people with like interests and um, <clears throat> with spare bedrooms. And then we have housing seekers that are looking for affordable housing options. So. If you, you know, have some flyers, if you have more information, um, I'll be available to answer any questions for you. Or if you have any questions right now, I'll be happy to answer them. It's the Catholic Charities website or the County um, Office of Support Housing. Say something about how you match people. Sure. Um, we do uh, basically like a, a personality profile. Um, we'll have you fill out an application. We'll have you describe your preferences. So if you're um, a housing provider that has an extra room, um, you know, we, we would ask you to think about, well, what, you know, who would you like to have living in your house? Because it's not like we're, uh, you know, sending you a prospective employee. This is somebody you should be sharing your home with. So you would want to think about things like what kind of relationship would you want to have with that person? Is it just a, you know, kind of a business thing? Do you want, um, you know, more of that person to be, you know, kind of integrated. You just want to have dinner together. Um, you know, so you need to think about your own, pre we ask you your own preferences. Um, you know, how you live, are you, you know, neat and tidy? Do you, you know, smoke in your home? And then also think about uh, who you would want living there. So things like, you know, would you want the person, you know, uh, to, you know, to be a student? Would you want someone that's retired, that's home all day? Uh, or not just at home all day, but, you know, just has a different schedule. Um, you know, uh, are they neat? Do you know what smoke uh, in the house? And just things like that. So we ask you to kind of go through all those preferences and, and try to match you with someone that matches your preferences and vice versa. Okay, so why don't we have questions <coughs> for Randy and Macaulay? Um, yes. I, I live on a street which has at one end apartments and a bungalow court and townhouses and then you hit the Los Altos border. <laughs> <laughs> and how did you or could you overcome the uh, rigidity of zoning that prevents multifamily houses in a single residence zone? Yeah, are there any success stories for rezoning? They are a few, yes, but zoning reform is the only thing called. I agree. I'm just asking, are there any success stories? Success stories. Yeah. Examples. In, in, in some cases, yes. And especially, uh, you know, yeah, it's easier 
to change the zoning if it was for a higher density, residential only kind of zoning, yeah. you know, like R3 and above, but uh, if it's single family zoning and prescribed very low density, then usually there's a lot of neighborhood opposition. But what we often do, you know, and um, Opticals um, specializes in having community design charrettes, you know, these are kind of multi-day workshops in which we literally ask for ideas and we show people options and try and get, you know, like a design solution that seems to fit the needs of the majority. So, you know, zoning reform often needs like that public participation and push to get officials to do it. So, you know, it has to come from the ground up. Right. Till the state makes you do it. Right. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Yes. Picking up on that, you know, I think underlying a lot of this missing middle concept is is getting away from the traditional zoning models yes, of absolutely. X setback, minimums, minimum setbacks, and, and heights, and things like that, to more of a form based approach. Exactly. And while Petaluma didn't necessarily do it specifically for missing middle, they did for, they did revolutionize their zoning code and went to a form-based code. So if you're looking for an example of a community that went to a form-based model, I'd encourage you to look at Petaluma. And for another, like I'm working on a downtown plan for Davis right now. So another community that is, the city council opted to go in for a form-based approach to control, you know, the way downtown might look over the next 40 years. So it's it's gradually picking up, you know, as a concept. Yeah, um, yeah as a retired teacher and a volunteer at the high school, knowing how what a crisis this is as far as keeping teachers and hiring them, um, the, a couple of school districts, I think Santa Clara was one that had extra land and built housing for teachers. Uh, how well has that worked and how tricky does that get as far as income requirements? I mean, you might have a teacher making $60,000, but then suddenly she gets married to somebody who works at Google and you can I mean, how do all those things work? Uh, and have they been successful? Um. My understanding is the Santa Clara program has been quite successful. I think, you know, to your comment about you know, about the, the the incomes and households and all that, I think that's something very critical to pay attention to. I, I know of a large school district in this state that shall go unnamed that made a critical mistake and realized it would have great difficulty filling their project. Their, their teacher housing project because the income levels were too restrictive. Mm -hmm. And this was largely driven by the way they funded the project. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think it, yeah, it's really critical to take that into account. Of course, you know, districts here, the Los Altos School District and Los Altos Mountain View the School District are very aware of, they're very aware of their teacher salaries, those income ranges, and should they ever do a, a teacher housing project that's already front of mind. Okay, Jeannie. Let me, let me share an example of a success story in this arena, and that is San Mateo, San Mateo County's Community College District. Okay, um, they in 2002 started an exploration, and in 2005, they actually built some employee housing um, on one of their campuses, uh, the San Mateo uh, campus. And um, th since then, they've also built one on the Kenyatta campus, and they're now in the um, final stages of approving the Belmont campus. But what they did is they carved off two acres, and they built employee housing. And how they handle this is actually kind of unique because in the city of Los Altos, when a developer is building affordable housing, they have to designate specific units in there. And instead of doing it that way, they've added this level of flexibility. So they are on the hook for X number in each of these projects to be affordable housing, but it's not tied to a specific unit. So what they do is as somebody moves out, okay, they put that one in at an affordable price because they're keeping the teachers um, the employees, not just teachers, it's all the workforce, um, in there for a seven year period of time. So they can, you're qualified to stay in there for seven years. So even if you married the Google person or whoever and you're making a lot of money, 
you're not automatically booted out as long as the next available one replaces, if that was an affordable, it becomes a new affordable one. And so this rotation works and their success is their waiting list as of uh, yesterday is 252 people, 252. Um, and so it is, it's a phenomenal program that they put in place. Thank you. Yeah. Questions? So, um, question for Randy. I'd like to understand better the economics of some of the newer projects that you've done. Because it, it looks like you did not build those on city land, for example, in Wilton Court, when that you had to pay market rate for property in Palo Alto. And the whole project, however, is affordable. So can you talk a little bit about that? And can you also comment on community benefits? I think in Los Altos, we uh, we get taken advantage of. We don't really understand how much we can ask for in terms of community benefits. So can you give us some ideas of how far we can push developers to really do something substantial if they're building uh, both market rate and affordable units in a project? Well, start with the community benefits first. Um, I'd really. For any city, and I've told this to many, many cities now that I've talked about, talk about Mountain Views, is the, the key part of many parts of Mountain View is that we undertook the uh, economic analysis to define what that community benefit ought to be. So looking at the expected returns and looking at what is a reasonable sharing of those, that, that financial return between private landowner developer and, and the community. So it's uh, for areas like San Antonio and El Camino, um, it's underpinned by a financial analysis, doing the same thing in the East Wisman area. In areas where uh, the, the exception to that rule in Mountain View is when a developer is proposing a general plan amendment or a zone change then those rules don't apply and those are done on a case-by-case -case basis. Uh, sometimes those are done through a project-specific e economic analysis. Sometimes those are do done uh, strictly through a negotiation. Um, but if you're building on El Camino or San Antonio, East Wisman, th that's a defined amount that's uh, based on economic analysis that the council has adopted. So that gives a level of predictability of what that fair share is. And then the council can make the decision of priorities of how that money should be targeted. And in a given year, do they want it to go towards open space, to traffic calming, pedestrian and bike improvements, you name it. Um, you were asking about uh, funding so some of our recent projects. So Wilton Court, um, we're almost fully funded. Um, we are roughly, we have a funding gap of roughly three and a half million dollars and we believe we know how we're going to get that money, but it's uh, not official yet. We have about 90, we have about, we're about 90 percent of the way to being able to start the project. And that's a combination we're expecting to get a little over ten million dollars from the city of Palo Alto. We're utilizing low income tax credits. Uh, we were hoping we are hoping to get some funding from the County of Santa Clara for, uh, the, uh, for that, that component of the project that houses the developmental disabled. We've been, uh, our board chair has been working closely with uh, uh, Joe Simidian's office to embed that into the county's upcoming budget. So we're very very hopeful. There's a couple other sm smaller funding sources, but that's the bulk of it. Um, yeah. So. I think the takeaway there is that most of these projects, these days, you have to cobble together multiple funding sources to make them work. And more questions. Um, I think your hand was up. Um, how does this concept of multifamily housing intersect with the concept of accessory <coughs> dwelling units? And if you have a home and you um, either you know build a separate structure or convert part of your house or add on to your house and make it an ADU, which I understand the state is encouraging and cities are now having to comply with um, uh, liberalized ADU policies, you're creating a multifamily dwelling by doing that. So how does, how does that intersect? I think the rules change from 
face to face about exactly how you can use that ADU. So for example, in, in Berkeley, and I think it's still not fully finalized yet, but you cannot use it as, an, as a full-time income property, that you cannot just rent it out to another family and call it a second home, on a, a second uh, living unit on your uh, lot, on your property. <coughs> so it, it can have periodic use, but it doesn't really fulfill that need of being able to give permanent housing to another family who, who's happy to do it. So yes, we feel it's a very, it's potentially a very powerful method of increasing or doubling, tripling, you know, the housing in our neighborhoods. But the exact structure with which, whether we call it single or single family housing, of a slightly different kind or multi-family housing, it's not clear. It it varies literally. It's very confusing, and it varies from city to city and from jurisdiction. So it must be the city because I visited an ADU on a property in San Jose, which clearly was set up to be a rental unit. Yes. So, so you can yeah. rent it out, but you cannot uh, rent it out for the full year. That is the rule that the city has. In Berkeley, yeah, not here, not here. So it varies from place to place. We're building 80s in Berkeley, and Berkeley City does now allow that people. In fact, they only they disallow air, air short-term rentals in 80s. Oh, so they 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 allow long-term. Mm -hmm. Interestingly, they allow short-term rentals in accessory buildings and not <laughs> long-term rentals and accessory buildings, but those are not accessory dwelling units. The key dip difference being that the existence of the kitchen. No kitchen. <laughs> Sadly, Los Altos never created buffer zoning so that those houses that are behind all the buildings now being done on El Camino are all single family. In other communities, they might have been duplexes or triplexes. Los Altos continues to force single family housing on very busy streets. For example, the two houses we did at Grant Road and Fremont Road, we begged to do duplexes. So is there a question? A question? It is a question. <laughs> <laughs> Randy, you especially, can we fix the lack of buffer zoning? Can we offer to some of these strip neighborhoods the ability to be more than single family? Well, I mean, <laughs> yeah, I mean, putting my other hat on, I guess, my previous hat. Um, you know, I, I won't speak specifically about the situation with Los Altos. I, I think look at our communities in general, whether they're Los Altos or Mountain View, Alto, on and on and on. You know, there are situations where you have homes on relatively busy streets. Some of them are already duplexes, in fact. You, and you look at the form of those units, and this is where it intersects with Matali's talk. If you look at the form of some of these units, if you design the right kind of structure, in the right size, they will be indistinguishable from what's already there. You know, what I think uh, one of the takeaways that we, we hope you hear tonight is that you know this is not an e necessarily an either or um, situation. You know, I'm not arguing against missing middle housing. Um, I think what we're trying to point out is that if in fact we have a Bay Area housing crisis, if you believe that as I do, then we need to be opportunistic. Communities have the ability and requirement now to allow ADUs. How can we take advantage of that for situations where a property owner wishes to do an ADU and provide essential housing in that manner? I think cities can look at opportunities around busy corridors and look at, uh, and look at ways to, to really tailor a new zoning code such that you can insert more units on that same piece of land in a way that's indistinguishable from what's there. Look at major corridors where you can have opportunities to go higher and denser and provide that injection of, of housing opportunities. It's not an either or, um, it's not an either or question we're posing to you. You know, it's, I, my daughter uses this phrase on me. She's 17 years old now. She goes, it's, she goes I think this is a, he goes, it's not a me problem, it's a you problem. <laughs> <laughs> but I think housing is not a me or a you problem, it's an us problem. 
right? It's an us problem. It's all about our communities. It's about people that work in our communities, that that teach our kids, that put out the fires, that bag groceries, on and on and on and on. People that we that serve us and serve our community every day. And that's in my mind makes it an us issue. So one more question. It's just a final comment. It's a question us or you Oh, sorry. Uh, I think the lack of affordable housing is a public health issue. Um, I've been doing focus groups with seniors in San Mateo County, and they literally can't downsize because they can't afford anything else. And they're forced to live in these homes with staircases. When you talk about the excessive commutes and the stress that it adds on the person and the family, I think we're looking at a larger issue than just simply having homes to put people in. All right. Thank you. So it is exactly 8.30, and I want to uh, let's all thank. <laughs> and I want to thank everybody who came, and to remind you that the uh, Los Altos Affordable Housing Working Group has a website, and we'd love to hear from you, and we're going to have um, continued events, and we'd like to know what topics you'd like to hear about. Um, one idea is something on, on ADUs. Make sure, please, to sign in, especially if you're not on our mailing list. And, <coughs> excuse me, thank you very much.